Welcome to the Office of Undergraduate Research Education Series. Today's presentation is Old, Rare, and Unique, an Introduction to Sp Special Collections Research, and our speaker is Rachel Ernst. And this is a virtual event, it's being recorded. So we ask everyone to mute themselves and to turn off their camera to ensure the best experience. And if you have questions, please use the chat feature or unmute yourself when you're invited by the speaker. And this is the event evaluation. We want everyone to complete this, but we want to remind the SPUR, Europe, and Early Exploration Scholars that they must complete this in order to receive credit for attending today. And I wanted to remind everybody that the mission of the Office of Undergraduate Research is to facilitate and promote undergraduate, student, faculty, collaborative research, and creative works in all disciplines throughout the U campus. And we would like to acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The U recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribe states and the federal government, and we affirm the U's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. And now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. She's Dr. Rachel Ernst. She's assistant librarian in the Marriott Library. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be with you today. We are going to start with a fairly basic question, which is what is Special Collections? So here at the U, Special Collections is located on the fourth floor at the Marriott Library. Generally, a special collections department is a unit of the library responsible for managing materials that are outside the general collection. So think of things like rare books or archival material, maps, oral histories, ephemera, things like that. So here at the U, on the fourth floor of the Marriott, you will find that we are a division with seven different departments, rare books, manuscripts and archives, print and journal, multimedia, book arts, university archives and records management, and preservation. I am Rachel Ernst. I'm the reference librarian for special collections. And my job is to make sure that researchers have access to our materials. And that takes a lot of different forms from individual research appointments in the reading room here on the fourth floor, to class sessions with faculty across campus, to working with long distance researchers and scholars to connect them with our materials either digitally or by doing on the ground citation and small research and reference question work for them. Some of the services that are included at, in special collections are individual research appointments, like I mentioned. Those are held in the George S. Eccles Reading Room on the fourth floor of the library, and that reading room is open Monday through Thursday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. It is by appointment only, and I will show you how to make an appointment later on in my talk. Um, I want to say that early because it sounds intimidating, but it really isn't. We are on the fourth floor, but not all our material lives here, so we have to have time to go and retrieve it, whether it's from the automated retrieval center in the library or from our storage space on the fourth and fifth floors. So that is the only reason you need an appointment, and I'm happy to talk you through that process in just a bit. If you would like to come up to Special Collections just to check it out, see our space, find where that reading room is, I'm also offering a walk-in sampler this semester. This is a pilot program. I haven't tried this before, so I'm curious to gather data this semester and see if this is something that meets students' research needs. So the sampler is four different items from four different collections that are always available. You don't need an appointment. You can just walk into the reading room. We have a table reserved for you, and you can ask the staff member at the desk uh, for a walk-in sampler item or all four. And they include things like a Greek epitaph from 200 CE, costume designs from a local Utah costume designer, skiing scrapbooks, um, as well as a bouldering guide from our print and journal department, just to give you a taste of the range of material that is in special collections. So if after this talk you are intrigued, come on up, ask to see that walk-in sampler, and it is available during those open hours, Monday through Thursday, 10 to 4. 
I also offer research consultations, and these can take place in a variety of ways. You can come to my office here in the library, which is right outside the reading room. You can, we can have a research consultation over the phone, over email, over Zoom, whatever is going to serve your needs best, I am happy to do. And what a consult looks like, you can come to me saying, I need to work on a project and here's kind of my bare bones idea and I will help you find material to flesh it out. Or you can come in with a fully fledged project and say, I just need help with citations or finding this one piece of information that I think is in the archive and I can help with that. So at any stage of the research process, I'm happy to work with you or pull in experts from the rest of my division to make sure we're getting you the information that you need. We also offer class sessions here in Special Collections. We have an instruction team of three. I am one of those faculty members, and we will work with any faculty member on campus who comes to us and says they would like a Special Collections class session. So far, I have offered classes in over 10 different disciplines. I have yet to say, no, I'm sorry, we don't have anything. So if you find this talk interesting or the materials that I'm gonna show you um, in just a bit interesting, feel free to let your professors know about us. They are welcome to bring your class to you material. I also offer show and tell sessions. So our individual research appointments are for one to two researchers. If a group of three or more are going to come, I can book one of our spaces here on the fourth floor, curate a list for them and give them a dedicated show and tell session where they get to handle materials, ask questions, and not worry about disturbing the quiet study space of the reading room. Um, so I mentioned spaces on the fourth floor. I'm in one of our spaces today. This is the Mariner S. Eccles Library of Political Economy. And this is attached to the reading room on the fourth floor at the Marriott. And it is an homage to Mariner S. Eccles' uh, office. He was the chairman for the Federal Reserve. Some of the furnishings in the room are original, like the wingback chair behind me. And the books are a library that he curated on the topic of economics, and they are available for study and reading in the reading room, which is right next door. The final thing I want to point out about services that we offer is our amazing book arts program. So if you have been up to the fourth floor, you may have seen the book arts studio, which is on the east side of our floor, and it is a fully working printing press and studio. You can take classes either as electives or the Book Arts program offers a major, a minor, or certificate, and recently uh, an MFA in partnership with the art school here at the U. So if you're interested in things like paper making, book binding, letter press, um, typesetting, things like that, that is the place for you to check out. And again, you can take those classes as electives. You don't have to make it uh, your major, minor, or a certificate. So that is an overview of the services that we offer here on the fourth floor. One department that, or two departments that I haven't talked about yet, one is University Archives and Records Management. They are part of our division, but they actually have their own building on Guardsman Way. So if you're interested in the history of the university, if you wanted to see papers from a particular department, or if you wanted to see faculty files, those would be requested through University Archives and Records Management because they have their own reading room on Guardsman Way in Building 213 next to the football field house. The process is the same for requesting those. You make that appointment and I just make sure it gets to them rather than to our reading room here. But that is one less visible department that I like to highlight because they do the really important work of preserving institutional knowledge here at the U. The final department that I had listed is preservation. And the Special Collections Division has a bespoke preservation lab here in the library, and they handle the care and preservation of all of our collection materials. So the lab is not open to the public for safety reasons, um, but it does essential work in making sure our collection materials will stay in viable condition for researchers for years to come. And you may be thinking, well, what does preservation look like? And it can take many forms. Some is as simple as building housings for materials or building a box that will keep something safe and contained um, to up to challenges like how do you store a silk dress from the 19th century? This is a question that came up a few weeks ago because we have a 19th century silk dress in the collection. I had pulled it for a researcher and realized that 
it was folded, which is not normally how you store textiles. So I reached out to our preservation team who agreed that it needed to be rehoused, started a whole conversation about textile conservation. And we now have a textile specialist coming in in the spring to give a talk on the best methods for storing housing and also showing um, textiles for researchers. So preservation does incredible work and it is very exciting to see how they make sure our materials are going to last for as long as they can. And then behind the scenes on the fourth floor, there are archivists and curators who process collections. They catalog materials, they scan materials for long distance researchers, they digitize fragile materials for people to access um, the surrogates so the originals stay intact. And they also work with born digital collections. So the fourth floor is very busy and we welcome you to come up whenever you would like. We currently have 29 faculty and staff members and a growing complement of part-time workers. So if you are ever interested in working in special collections, keep an eye on the library job boards. We do post regularly as positions become available. One of the things that faculty and staff here in special collections do is research. So we have our own projects that we're working on that we are publishing in. So I wanted to give you an overview of what those special collections projects look like right now. So up in preservation, our head of preservation, Randy Silverman, is part of an international team of researchers who is working on a project from Jikji to Gutenberg. And that project is examining the traces of heavy metals left behind during the printing process in early printed books and pages. So things like the Gutenberg Bible or Korean texts that were printed even 100 years earlier that are showing traces of metal. And the reason they're doing this is they are trying to study the origins of book printing from cast metal types. So something that initially here in the West we assigned to Gutenberg in 1450, but it's actually looking like metal type was used much earlier, which is exciting um, because that allows us to think about the universality of print culture and to think of print printing as a global endeavor instead of merely a Western endeavor endeavor. Another project that preservation is working on is with Arabic block prints called Tarsh. And they are studying, we have seven of them in the collection. They are studying those to think about how printing techniques traveled from East Asia to Europe during the Middle Ages. Um, and to do that, our Arabic block prints are also traveling. They have traveled to Stanford with one of our conservation technicians to be analyzed using um, X-ray fluoroscope. And they are now at the Smithsonian, so coast to coast, um, getting some more research and work done to think about what materials were used to create them and how that influences our ideas of print culture. Other departments in the division are working on and grant funded projects. So we have one um, archivist working in our cataloging department with a grant from the National Archives to remediate metadata for women's collections. And remediating metadata means making our collections more discoverable and more accessible. So that means changing outdated terms, updating names, adding information that previously didn't exist in the catalog records. So more researchers can find the material more quickly. And the other Another grant is a National Endowment of the Humanities grant also to enhance metadata, but that is for artist books and illustrated books. And what this um, staff member is working on is making sure that the physical characteristics of these very complex, very beautiful books are available in the catalog. That information also goes out to international databases, and this is going to allow users better access and fuller descriptions of our collection that are not present elsewhere. And then the final project I'm going to highlight, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how special collections came to be at the U before we look at collection materials. Um, our rare books librarian is working on a machine learning project to help fill in missing parts of Arabic uh, manuscripts that we have here in the collection. We have one of the largest Arabic paper, papyrus, and parchment collections in North America, but some of them are quite old and have gaps in the in the text um, because the papyrus is literally gone. Uh, there are gaps, physical gaps in the actual pieces of papyrus paper or parchment. And so the project's goal is to see if 
by scanning these pieces, we can piece together enough of an alphabet that the machine learning program could fill in those gaps for us. So lots of fascinating things happening in special collections using our materials with our faculty and staff members doing all of this intriguing academic and scholarly work around them. So the final thing I'll say before we talk a little bit more about how Special Collections came to be is that Special Collections is open to anyone. So students, staff, and faculty here at the U, community members are welcome to come, long distance researchers of any type. Um, anyone can use our resources. We're a state institution and we are, our doors are open and welcoming. So if you've never been up, if you have been up and you wanna bring friends or family, please feel free to do so. Um, just remember the reading room is open Monday through Thursday from 10 to four. There is that walk-in sampler or you can make an appointment to see something specific. So, so far I have talked about present day special collections and you may be wondering how the division came into being in the first place. So how did we get things like Arabic papyrus, paper and parchment? How do we have rare books or archival materials? So special collections started back in the very beginning uh, with the University of Deseret. John R. Park, the first president of the university donated his library, his own personal library as the core of the university's library. And it was officially gifted to the university in 1894. A few years before that, the Utah Territorial Library also donated um, around 3,000 volumes to help jumpstart the university library. In 1946, um, the earliest antecedent of today's special physical special collections division was the Utah Room, or what was initially actually called the Treasure Room, which I find very charming. And it was established to house notable collections related to Utah history. And there were a few key collections that helped establish the Utah Room. The first was the John A. Woodstow Collection of Mormon Americana joined by the John Mills Whitaker Collection and the personal library of Judge Tillman D. Johnson. And the final collection was the William Dawson Congressional Papers. These landmark collections were the start of special collections, and the Utah Room provided dedicated space for researchers to access them. In 1967, as the collections were continuing to grow, so from, so from those initial collections, the library continue adding more material on Utah history, on Western American history. Um, and based on that, in 1967, the Utah Room was renamed Western Americana, Rare Books, and University Archives. And that showed collection development around printed materials about the eight intermountain states with an emphasis on Utah, Salt Lake City, and Western exploration. And that is why Western Americana um, was the first part of that collection name. Then in 1968, the University Library moved to its current home. J. Willard Marriott had donated $1 million to the university, which at the time was the largest single donation the school had ever received. And that gift, was allotted for collections at the library. So the then director of Western Americana, Everett Cooley, was able to purchase two significant collections of books. The first was he was able to purchase over 50% of the Wagner Camp bibliography. This was a list of books about Western American history and exploration. And with that purchase, the university became one of the top universities to have um, the bulk of that collection. And then the second part of the gift funded 1,000 titles related to the history of science. And that included classics such as works by Andreas Solarius, Andreas Vesalius, and Charles Darwin. I actually have the Darwin to show you today. It's a first edition of The Origin of Species and is pretty great. Um, but the Marriott gift really helped us establish the rare books portion um, of special collections. So in 1971, as the collection started reflecting growing research topics, it was finally renamed to special collections, which is the name that it retains today. So over the next 50 plus years, the department developed, expanded its collection strengths, established new departments as new types of materials were introduced, and engaged more intentionally with larger campus communities and beyond. So things like the multimedia department arose as we started receiving things like video, moving image, sound, photographs, born digital materials. Um, so the division adapts as new types of materials start entering the collection. 
So fast forward to today, where our collection strengths still include Western history, but have expanded to outdoor recreation, oral histories, book history and print culture, University of Utah history, artist books, and many more topics. If you are interested in something, it's highly likely that we have a book or archival material about it, and we would love to have you come in to show it to you. So this is a very brief snapshot of what Special Collections history looks like. But if you're interested in learning more, there is a digital exhibition on the library website, as well as a virtual lecture on the history of Special Collections, which is based on a physical exhibition that I co-curated last summer with Luba Basin, our rare books librarian. And we have made it available digitally um, as the physical ex exhibition switch out about every three to four months here on the fourth floor. So one of the things that I want to point out is that Special Collections is not a static collection of dusty books and papers, but it's an active collecting entity. So you can see how the collections changed over time, um, looking at this timeline, and they are still growing and developing. So Special Collections acquires materials in a few different ways. We research and purchase to fill collection gaps and to strengthen collections. So a recent purchase was a wood block by Pietro Mattioli, who was a botanist and physician in the 16th century. He wrote a very important, very famous Renaissance herbal, which is a book on botany and medicine. And we bought a wood block that was used to print the illustrations in the second edition of that herbal. So getting to have the book with the illustrations and then having the wood block to see the printing process and how illustrations were made in the 16th century is a really amazing experiential hands-on learning process and allows researchers to think more deeply about how books were created. So that is an example of how we research and purchase to support our already existing collections. We also get offered donations. So right now we have an online form that allows people to offer donations to special collections. It goes to a donations committee who meets monthly and they consider the requests and reply to the donors. Some of the things we consider about whether to include material in special collections include subject matter, how do, it fits into the overall collection, the type of material, the condition of the material, the space, and the use value. So one thing uh, special collections are always fighting against is the fact that the more we collect, the less space we have. So we have to consider, do we have space for this collection or these items someone wants to give us? Um, another thing that we really do think about is use value. Is this the best institution for this material? Sometimes Sometimes we get offered a donation and we say, you know what, Utah State actually collects that material. We think it would be much better used there. And we will suggest um, another institution to the researcher or to the donor because our goal is to make sure material gets used. We don't want it languishing on a shelf. We want to make sure that it will be used and enjoyed uh, by researchers. Another way that we acquire material is through rare book and antiquarian dealers who will approach us with material that they think fits our collection. And we also take suggestions and we support our faculty in their teaching and research. So if university faculty need materials for a class or for their research and we are able to acquire it, we do. Recently, I was able to help acquire a collection by an old English translator. Um, and that was a really exciting collection to bring in to help bolster classes in the English department. And as we think about guidelines, why something ends up up here on the fourth floor in special collections rather than the general collection, um, we do think about things like subject matter, age, scarcity, fit with the collections and condition. A few things I'm going to show you today are going to look very popular, very mass market, and you may wonder why they're up here in special collections. And that's because though they may be you know, made in the last 25 years, they're very scarce. They're either out of print, they're from a limited run, or they support the collection. We want to make sure that they are always there for researchers. So all of those are the considerations we think about as we think about what comes into our collection and how we make it accessible for researchers. So our overall goal is to preserve and make accessible old, rare, and unique materials for researchers as long as possible. So now that I've given you an overview of what we do here in Special Collections uh, and where we're coming from, 
I want to take some time to show you tips and tricks for researching in special collections. Some of you may already be familiar with these platforms. Um, some of you may have used them for the main library, but not for special collections. And this may be new to some of you as well. Wherever you are, I'm going to model how to search, how to find material, and then how to request it through the appointment form. So the first place I will direct your attention is the library catalog. This should hopefully look familiar to everyone. If it doesn't, welcome. This is your one-stop shop for the Marriott Library. You go to the library homepage. You put in your keywords. In this case, climbing in Utah. We go to the sources. We see that we have almost 2,000. And then we go to this right-hand menu. And like I was saying, we go to that location filter. and click on Marriott Library Special Collections. And what this does is it shows you things that are available here on the fourth floor. You may notice that some of the things are available here on the fourth floor and downstairs in the general collection. Um, and that's fine. If the general collection copy is out, that means we always have one available for researchers. And the reason I chose to look at climbing is because outdoor recreation is one of our collection strengths. And I also think this is a really practical way to use special collections. So if you like to climb, if you want to come in and read about climbing and bouldering in Utah, if you want to come in and look at a guide and maybe snap some photos of a particular route you're hoping to climb, those are all things that you can do. So you don't have to be writing a paper um, on, on climbing. You don't have to be a scholar who studies outdoor recreation. This is a really practical way to come in and use our materials knowing that these books will always be here, even if the general collection titles are checked out. So if you click into the catalog record, you're going to see that it says ARC request at special collections desk. And you may think that you can log in uh, to request it just like you can for things in the general collection. You cannot. Uh, so only staff and faculty in special collections are allowed to request our materials. So when you see that message, what you need to do is write down the title, and the call number. And then once you have everything that you know you want to see, that's where we're going to go to that appointment form and put that information in and request an appointment so you can come up and see that material. So remember, title, call number, and then we'll be able to work from there to make sure that we are requesting the right material for you. All right, so that is the best way to find published material. So things that have been printed by a publisher, use the library catalog, that's where you're going to find them, including our rare books. So even our really old things you'll be able to find in the catalog. But if you are interested in manuscript or archival material, so things like journals or a corporation's records, those are not published. And while you can find them in the catalog, it is much harder. So I recommend going to Archives West. And this is our finding aid inventory. A finding aid or a finding aid repository, excuse me. A finding aid is an inventory. It is a list of what is in any particular collection. So in this case, I mentioned journals. So let's try that. What do we have in the collection um, that include journals? Archives West is a little slow. So I'm going to chat while it makes up its mind about what it's going to show us. It is also a multi-state repository. So once you've done your search, you will want to limit to University of Utah Special Collections or University of Utah Archives and Records Management if you're looking for history of the U materials. And you can just do that right over here. You just click and it will narrow your search down even further. So you see that we have 848 finding aids that include journals somewhere in the documents. Some of them are photocopies, and we try to make that very clear if you're not going to be seeing originals, um, but some of them are originals. And you can scroll through and see if any of the names jump out to you. If you're local, you may see family names, which is always really fun. And the one thing I do like to point out is you can click into a finding aid to see what it looks like. It has a title, it has a collection number, it gives us a summary, there's a biographical note, there's a content description. Some of them, if they're larger collections, have this great little index over here. But the part that I really like is finding aids are searchable. So you can Command F if you're on a Mac, 
um, and see why it pulled this one up. So I had put in journals. Let's see what it was tagging. So we see that this collection for Judith Hallett has her Europe journals from 2001 to 2002. And you'll also notice we have these numbers over here on the side. These numbers are the box and the folder that the material comes in. So if you want to see those Europe journals, just like you did in the catalog record, you're gonna jot down some information. You're gonna make sure you write down the box and folder number. So box four, folders two through three. Then you're gonna grab the title of the collection, Judith D. Hallett Papers, and the collection number. That is basically the call number for a box. So you've looked at the catalog and you have a book that you wanna see or multiple books that you you want to see. You've looked at Archives West and you have materials that you would like us to pull and have ready and waiting for you in the reading room. So the final question is, okay, how do, how do I get this material? How do I request it? And that is really simple. You go back to that library homepage, you go to the research tab and find the special collections homepage. And the request an appointment button is right there at the top. So you fill out this brief form You'll notice that we ask if you're a member of the U. Like I said, anyone is welcome to come to Special Collections. If you already have a unit, you already have a library account, and you don't need to provide us with any more information. If someone is visiting and they're not part of the U, they just bring in an ID so we can set up an account so that we can check material out to them for use in the room. Our materials do not circulate, so you will stay in the room while you're reading them. You can tell us if you'd prefer reproductions or an in-person appointment. And then this box is where you put that title and call number, that title collection number and box numbers that you would like to see. There's also an optional box to tell us what you are researching. And the reason we offer this is you may find things you're interested in and tell us you wanna see them. But if you tell us your research topic, we may be able to recommend more material or material that is better focused for what it is that your research question is asking. So this lets you, um, draw on the expertise of the entire division because the ticket goes out to all of us and then the correct curator or archivist picks it up and confirms your appointment and answers any questions. And the final piece is you tell us when you want to come in. So again, Monday through Thursday, 10 to 4. We do schedule in two-hour blocks, so appointments begin at 10, 12, and 2. But if you can't get here until 1.30 because you have class, not a problem. Just include that as a note and we'll mark it on the calendar so we know when to expect you. Then you hit submit. And you keep an eye on your email. When we answer um, on our side, it will send you an email confirming your appointment, answering any questions, and providing you with any further information if we think there's other material that might be helpful for your research. So those are the three basic places to start your special collections research. The Library Catalog, Archives West, and then the appointment form. If you are not able to make it to the library physically, another great resource is the digital library. So if we go back to that library homepage, I really did say it was a one-stop shop and it is. Go back to that library homepage, click on research again, and right above special collections is our digital library. And this is material that has been digitized. So sometimes it's also available physically in the reading room. Um, sometimes it's not, but it is always available digitally. So you can search here if you can't make it during our open hours or it's late at night, but you want to see if we have something. And this is a quick way to check if you can access it right away. So I did a search for a Bravenel Hall, the home of the Utah Symphony downtown, and at the heart of a lot of discussions about what downtown is going to look like with sports teams coming in. And you'll see that we have 447 things that have a Bravenel Hall in them as a keyword. And you can click on the photo. You can actually download the file. You can send the reference URL to someone else. But I'd want to let you know that this repository is also a multi-institution repository and not all this material is actually at the Marriott Library. So if you want to use this, um, if you need to cite it, you're going to want to double check who, the, who it belongs to. Um, and here we see it says it's part of the Ski and Snow Sports Archives. And that is here at the University of Utah. And you can see that it was donated to the university um, by the photographer. If it is not from the university, 
you can always check the holding institution field and it will tell you. And a lot of times things are from the Utah Historical Society. This one's also ours. So that was not as helpful an example as it could have been. Um, but if you find something and you want to use it and you need permission or citate more citation information, just check that holding institution, see who it belongs to. You can always reach out to us and we can uh, hopefully give you contact information for other institutions. So those are all the best platforms for our materials. So the collections that we have here. You may be thinking, well, do other universities have special collections? What other archives could I have access to? And I would encourage you to explore. So with digitization, and with the internet, we all have far more access than we ever had to special collections. So some places you might want to check out are the Mountain West Digital Library, the Digital Public Library of America, the Library of Congress, and the National Archives. All of those have material available digitally, so you don't actually have to travel to, say, Washington, D.C. to be able to view those materials. I will warn you that every institution has their own guidelines for who can access their materials and how. So always consult individual websites, make sure that you know their procedures. And I highly recommend contacting archives or special collections before you plan a visit to make sure the material you're interested in is available, is open for research and is ready for you. The worst scenario for me as a reference librarian is when someone has traveled and they arrive and I cannot accommodate their request because I haven't uh, known about it beforehand and the material is not readily on hand. So researching uh, and archives procedures will just help make sure that you get to see what you want to see uh, when you are able to do it. And I know that traveling for research is often cost prohibitive. So if you find material in other institutions, you can ask them what materials are available online or if they have a policy for reproductions. We do provide reproductions for long distance researchers at a per page fee. Um, but we can only do so within copyright and fair use limitations, and some departments have caps on how many things that you can request. Not all institutions offer this, and I know that reproductions don't work for all types of materials, but it is worth it if you don't have a huge research budget and you need to access materials that are not held here at the University of Utah. And the final thing I want to show you is what do you do when you're actually finally looking at this material? And so I've provided some research guiding questions and it gives you four things to do when you're sitting in front of a rare book or a manuscript or something from the print and journal department. And the first is identify the item. What are you looking at and how does its format influence your engagement with it? Then contextualize it. Where did it come from? Who created it? Whose point of view is represented? And then examine things like the finding aids, so that list, that inventory that I showed you. Uh, maybe there's a description with it or a label. Any other identifying materials will help answer these questions. And then experience the item. Read, watch, view, or handle it. How do you interact with it? What kind of content does it have? What do you learn from it? And the final piece is where you are producing something from your research, and that's analyze the item. How does it engage with your research question? What questions does it raise? Is there more information you might need? And how does the item push your research in new or interesting directions? So that is a basic guide of how to complete special collections research here at the University of Utah with some guidelines for going out to other institutions, and then a set of questions to help you actually engage with the item when you have it in front of you. So if you're not sure where to start, I know I threw a lot of information at you very quickly. Um, feel free to contact me by email, by phone, by the appointment form. You're welcome to drop by my office. It's Marriott Library 4300A. It's just inside the reading room. Uh, if my door is open, you're welcome to stop by and say hi. So the last thing I want to do with you all today is show you some things from the collection. So you will forgive my low tech setup, my document camera that I usually stream with yes, uh, broke yesterday. So I'm gonna adjust my camera and set up some materials for you to see. All right, so this is the first object that I wanted to show you today. And it is actually the oldest object that we have here in special collections. It is a Sumerian cuneiform tablet 
that is 4,000 years old. It's very, quite small, you can see, compared to my hands, and it is actually a receipt. It is a receipt for grain, for beer, for an event. And if you look closely, and I don't know if this camera is going to be able to pick it up, I'm going to give it a try. If you look closely at the top, you can actually see and feel the fingerprints from the scribe who initially held the wet clay and wrote on it with his stylus. So to have a connection to a human from 4,000 years ago is pretty amazing. I get goosebumps every time. I've worked here for two and a half years. I pull this quite often and it never, it never gets old. So that is our Sumerian clay tablet from 4,000 years ago. One of the things that our collections do really well, they help us think about the history of writing and printing. And the next thing that I'm going to show you uh, is going to sound familiar because I talked about this printer a little bit in the earlier part of my talk. So what we are looking at now is a leaf from a Gutenberg Bible. So Johannes Gutenberg, we say invented the printing press and using movable metal type. We now know there's a much longer history that led to it. Um, but he printed the Gutenberg Bible on the European printing press in 1450. And you'll see that it is in amazing condition um, for something from that long ago. This is just one page. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the donors would buy rare books and they would distribute leaves to multiple universities. Not every university could have the whole book, so they gave it part of the book. We don't encourage this now. We prefer that rare book stay intact, but it does mean that we get to have something like uh, a wonderful page from a Gutenberg Bible available for our researchers. A few things I want to point out. You'll see that even though this is a printed page, it still has several callbacks to the manuscript tradition, including the two columns, as well as handwritten and hand-colored initial letters. So printing is not something that was binary that we moved from manuscripts to printing, um, the manuscript tradition still continues to influence the printing tradition today. All right, so that was the Gutenberg. The next thing I'd like to show you, I pulled in honor of Banned Books Week, which is this week. And this book is a first edition of Galileo's Dialogues. So this book was published in 1632. It was banned by the church in 1633. Galileo was placed under house arrest. He actually died under house arrest. And all copies of the book were supposed to be burned. Clearly, they were not because this one survived. And it's a pretty pristine condition. Um, so we have our frontispiece here, and we have Aristotle, Ptolemy, and Copernicus in dialogue, talking to each other. And Galileo's work um, supported Copernicus's heliocentric model of our solar system. Um, but it was, like I said, banned. So we can be thinking, especially this week, about the freedom to read, how knowledge and ideas can or cannot be suppressed, and the importance of um, the printed word in in disseminating ideas. The one final detail about Galileo that's important to remember is that he did not write in Latin. He did not write in the scholarly language. He actually wrote this book in the vernacular, so he wrote it in Italian, which meant anyone who was literate, not just scholars, um, could read this book, which led to a rapid spread of his ideas. I did want to point out that this book, even though it is in excellent condition, has had some preservation work done. You can see that they have repaired the binding here. The paper is a slightly different color. And you'll notice if you ever come see the book in person that they saved all of the threads from the binding because that is part of the book's history. And so we don't throw away the, the threads from 1632, but we keep them so you can see how books were made through time. All right, so the final rare book I wanna show you today is Charles Darwin's um, On the Origin of Species. And this one, also in excellent condition, is exciting because it has a paste down with Charles Darwin's um, signature. And so I don't believe that Darwin signed this book. I think he signed this piece of paper and it was pasted in, which uh, often happened in the 19th century. But with the box that this 
book is housed in comes a letter from someone who wrote to Darwin and Darwin's response. So thinking about the humans who actually read these books, who owned these books, who interacted with authors, um, by having this book with those two letters allows us to think beyond just what's on the printed page to the lives and the study and the research that went into these titles. So now I want to shift gears um, and move to a different department. So we have talked about our rare books department. You just saw three really, or four really excellent examples. And now I wanna move to our manuscripts department. One of our collection strengths here at the Marriott are oral histories. So these are one-on-one -on -one conversations with different community members. This oral history is part of the Pacific Islanders Oral History Project, which is included in the Everett Cooley Oral History Project. And you'll see that this is a transcript. And it is a conversation between an individual and an interviewer. And most of our oral histories are from different communities here in Utah or here in Salt Lake City, talking about their lived experiences, talking about immigration, talking about religion, talking about racism, all of the things that they've experienced here in the Valley. So this is an amazing primary source that lets you see other people's points of view and hear it in their voice rather than mediated through an author or through other secondary filters. So if you're interested in oral histories, we have so many of them. Some just have transcripts, some just have audio, and some have both. So sometimes you can actually hear the person speaking, um, which is a pretty great way to hear their own stories. So another collection strength is Utah history. And so the next item I have pulled for you is from our Japanese relocation collection. During World War II, Japanese Americans were forcibly removed from their homes on the West Coast and incarcerated in prison camps, including one here in Utah um, called Topaz. It was down in Delta, Utah. This is artwork made by one of the Japanese American people who were incarcerated. And this is artwork of the camp itself. So you see the barracks, you see how barren and desert like it was because this was in Southern Utah. And then you see people going about their day. We have a very large Japanese American archive. Uh, it includes things like artwork, school essays, it includes government papers, um, oral histories, and it is one that we are constantly growing. So not only do we want to acknowledge our history, but we also want to stay connected to the communities that make up Salt Lake City. All right, moving on. I want to show you something from print and journal. So this is one of those books that I mentioned that was going to be um, a popular book or something that looks like it's not old and I can find it on, on Amazon. You know, why is it here? So it's called Ghosts of Gold Mountain. And it's the story of the Chinese who built the Transcontinental Railroad. So the Western part of the Transcontinental Railroad was built largely by Chinese immigrants. And this is their history, which was a history that was often ignored, overlooked, or silenced um, until the until the 20th, the late 20th and early 21st centuries. So this is a secondary source that supports uh, the rest of our collections rather than being a primary source. So it is a secondary source, but it supports the rest of our collections, including our multimedia collection. And I am going to pause for a second to put on gloves. You may have noticed that I've been using just bare hands with everything. Um, it really is safest for our items to use clean bare hands unless you are handling photographs, which is what I am going to show you now. Then we put gloves on and that is to keep oils and dirts um, from our hands from transferring to the material. So what have I have pulled to show how we need secondary or why we need secondary sources on railroads are photographs, in this case, stereographs from our railroad photograph set, um, collection. A stereograph, you can see it's two images side by side. You would place it in a stereograph reader and it would merge the images into one three-dimensional image. So we have an entire railroad collection that includes stereographs, that includes pictures of when they joined both sides of the transcontinental railroad um, and other pictures of the 19th century uh, railroads that crisscrossed Utah. So that is one way that our collections talk to each other across departments and can fully flesh out your research um, with pieces from multiple departments. All right, I'm now going to show you one last photograph. 
And this is from the Alberta Hunt Nicholson collection. Now, Alberta Nicholson learned to fly here in Salt Lake. She was one of the first test women test pilots for the United States Air Force, and she served in the Women Air, for Air Service Pilot Program, the WASP program during World War II. This program um, did not recognize these women as being enlisted. They did not get benefits like military pensions or VA benefits um, and weren't recognized until decades after the war, but they flew missions. They served as test pilots. They were an integral part for the year that the program was in existence um, to the World War II effort here in the States. Uh, and this is Alberta. We have a whole, uh, we have a small collection on Nicholson, including a a whole box of photographs that are photographs of her and her other trainees and then follow her through the rest of her life as she continues flying in and around Salt Lake um, and it's a really just a, a really amazing collection to see both history as well as a personal life and a personal um, passion uh, for flying that she exhibited. All right, I know we are coming up on time and I wanna have a few minutes for questions, but I did want to show you one last thing and that is one final book. I know I have mentioned our book arts program. So I did wanna make sure that we ended with an artist book. Artist books are beautifully made, usually by hand. They're usually limited runs. So there may only be 15 ever made or 50 ever made. And they often challenge challenge our ideas of what a book can be and what a book can look like. So I pulled one of my favorites. It is called Mondrian's Flowers, and it has these incredible two-page illustrations on this gorgeous handmade paper. And these help support our book arts program, but can also be used by anyone who is interested in art and bookmaking techniques, or just like something beautiful uh, to look at. I do highly recommend this one. And if you are familiar with the artist Mondrian, I do suggest looking at the spine because this artist paid homage to one of his uh, most famous works that uses this design and colorway that you see here on the spine. All right, as much as I would love to keep showing you things, I want to make sure that we have some time for questions. So go ahead and pop your questions in the chat, or if you'd like to come off mute and ask your question out loud, feel free to do that. Uh, there's a question from a registrant. What is the express criteria for special collections? I think you covered that though. Yes, but it's such a great reminder of like what makes something special. And so we do, we think about age, we think about scarcity, and we think about uh, subject matter. How does it fit into our collections? How will it support research um, from our known research community? Which is the hardest of the collection to keep preserved? Yeah, this is such an interesting question because there's so many different challenges depending on the type of material. I don't work in preservation. Um, I have so much off of our preservation team. But I mentioned that Utah silk dress, one of the things that I've been learning about is textile conservation and how things like light can affect textiles or how folding it one way for too long leaves a crease and could potentially damage the material. So learning things like textiles are best stored flat or they're best handled with gloves um, or we need to keep them away from light. So how do we think about our spaces? Do we, you know, we have UV filters on our windows. We have UV shades that we use. Um, and I'm actually in the process of doing a light study with the preservation team to see what light is like in our exhibition site uh, spaces to make sure that our light levels are safe for our materials. So I think while there are multiple challenges, uh, textiles are one that have been on my mind uh, a lot recently. Wow, that is interesting. Well, is there any other questions? If not, why don't we go to the last two slides? So I did have one last slide here with my contact information. If you have any questions, feel free to get in touch. And this QR code is for uh, the appointment form. I just want to remind everybody about the event evaluation. I just put the link in the chat. Um, re remind Europe, Wilkes, and early exploration scholars, they must complete this in order to get a credit for attending today. And I just want to remind everyone that the Office of Undergraduate Research is in the SEAL Center, which is east of the Union. Um, we're open Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. Our website is our.utah.edu, and you can email us at our.utah.edu. And thank you again, Dr. Ernst. Um, this was very interesting and fascinating.
Thank you, Shelly. And thank you to everyone who came out today. I really enjoyed talking with you and feel free to get in touch with questions.